I didn't give myself a way out. You know what I mean? Like I didn't go, oh, I'll, I'll have this part-time job. I'll no do, plan I B. No plan B, dude. I was donating plasma. I was living in my car, and I'm like, I'm going to either make it, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm here with one of the legends of the oh. Latin comedian community. <laughs> Joy Medina, you're on Check It Out. Uh, legend just means old now, man. Nah, like, oh, I'm dog. No, 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 no. My grandpa's a legend. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you, brother. Yeah, man, you know... Uh, yeah, that's one of the things, you know, when you're, when you're part of the original Latin Kings of Comedy, you always have that title. So that's good. It's kind of yeah. like, you know, being a heavyweight champ. You're, you're always the champ after that. Yeah. You know, or a president or something like that. Well, here's the thing about comedy, man. Let's be mm -hmm. honest. You can be an older comedian these days. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And, that, and, and that's even better because I'll tell you why. Because I, I did both. I was a professional athlete like a thousand pounds ago. And, uh, you know, comedy. And when you're an athlete, after so many years, man, it, it you know, you're done. It's you, you only have so much left in you, right, physically. But as a comedian or any type of other artist that's not physical, you just get better and better and better because you just, you honing your craft, you're working with different people. I've toured, you know, since the Latin Kings of Comedy, I've toured around the world. So I've performed for audiences in, in Europe. I've performed in Vietnam. I'm the first American to headline Vietnam, not including military. That's, that's Bob Hope stuff, right? But um, I did Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Croatia, Mal uh, Macedonia. I, I perform in places that I, I can't even spell, to be honest. <laughs> Bosnia. And uh, so, so to do that, that's... You know that that takes experience. You gotta, you gotta, you can't go up there and do jokes about the four or five right. when you're in Bosnia or or Vietnam. They're like, well, what's Bo what's the four or five? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, you you definitely, you know, you you can do the the community stuff, but you can also do the universal stuff. Is that you? Is that what you think holds some like some of the local Lat Latino comics back? Is that they kind of they're since they're always kind of playing to their crowd, mm -hmm. they their their comedy is a little contained to like the local yes. Chicano experience, Southern California, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that happens with any when any kind of uh, crowd, rather, rather, I mean, a uh, uh, comedian, rather you're a East Coast comic, West Coast comic, or a small town comic, you work in your small circle, so that's all you talk about. You know what I mean? You only talk about LA, or you only talk about the East, uh, New York, or you only talk about Houston, or wherever you are, right? Tucson, or whatever. But when, once you start traveling, you'll start opening up. And like, I love when I go somewhere new because automatically I start gaining jokes. You know, like I started working on cruise ships which is I, I thought I'll never do. It's not a bad thing. Have you gotten sick? No, thank okay. God. Thank God. But, um, you know, so every time I'm on there, I got my fingers crossed. But I start working on cruise ship, and I'm like, oh, man, am I going to write new material for cruise? And it, right away, I started writing material. Bang, 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 bang. And um, because, you know, as a comedian, you're trained to look at something and think of something funny about it. So it doesn't matter if it's bad or sa sad or whatever. And um, so um, you're always writing as a comic. And the, and the better comic you are, the more experience you have, the more things you start writing about. But as far as, you know, go back, go, going back to what you said about Latino comics, I think Latino comics are actually doing so much better now than they yeah. used to do. When I, when I first started, Latino comics had to do tortilla jokes, tia right. jokes, right. you know, and, and I'm not saying these jokes aren't good anymore. They're just, everybody's done them, mm -hmm. you know? So you would do a, a Latin show and a Latino show and you would see three, four, five comics doing the same premises mm -hmm. over and over and over and over again. But now that comedy is so more universal and it's so traveling, or you know, traveling, comics are traveling and co people from around the world are watching it on television or uh, on the internet and they, they're they're learning our humor. Latino comics now are just comics; they really right. are, you know. But there's still some in the, be the especially the newer cats that right. are they're like, "Hey, I'm gonna do a great tortilla joke." I'm like, "Dude, I did that joke 80 years ago, bro." <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, and and they're also they're playing to their own personal personality, yeah, like yeah. Felipe Esparza. Like it's 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 there's only one Felipe Esparza, right? Right. You know what I'm saying? And and I, I'm good friends with Francisco Ramos. Right. Uh, you know, he's really making his own kind of like voice. Uh, you know, Carlos Santos and stuff. Um, let me ask you this, because you know there was a couple years, uh, um, you know early on where I tried stand-up comedy and there was a couple years I would, I would go to do the open mics or the bringer shows at the comedy store and right, stuff right. like that. And because I wasn't like a regular comedian or someone that did comedy all the time, it was like, like I, I was nervous. I, I, I had to drink a, a couple beers, which, which you, know, you should not have more than two beers before you go up. I realized that. <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> well, I think you can handle it. But I needed, it was, it was like stressful, even though it was five, seven minutes on right, stage. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, 
are you're past that, right? You're so comfortable on stage, you don't even get butterflies when you go up. Or yeah, do you? Do you yeah, want a little of that nervousness? No, but it still comes every once in a while. And first of all, what you what you felt is it's perfectly normal. Right. Because it is very unnatural for us as human beings to get up on a stage in front of strangers and try to make them laugh. Not just talk to them. Talking to them is bad enough, but trying to get a response is super unnatural. So you, so we have to fight that. It's kind of like the people that you ever see the people jumping out of airplanes and they're they're doing flips or they'll throw out the parachute first and they go, I'll get it later, and then they jump out. You're like, what is wrong with like how are they doing that? They're so comfortable because they've done it so much over and over and over again. And comedians is the same way. The only time now I get nervous is when I do something that's different. So for instance, like the first time I performed on the cruise ships, they're they're doing material on cruise ships is different. Um, you know, I'm doing, I have to do five separate shows for the same exact audience. You know, if I do a corporate gig where I'm performing for a corporation where they're having food and I'm now I have to talk while they're having food and do, all that does, I get my, I get the nerves come back. But then I, I know how to use it. I know how to use that again, you know, uh, for me. And, you know, like for instance, anybody who's, who's watching, who's a performer or has to stand up in public to speak or anything, the, the easiest trick I could give you all you do is you tell yourself out loud before you hit that podium or you hit that stage or that microphone, all you have to say is tell yourself, I want to be here. Mm. And the second you say that to yourself, you override that fear because what's happening, you're, you know, you're getting on stage and your, your brain is telling your body, oh, we got to be scared. This isn't good. This is scary. No, I don't, want, I don't want this. But when you go, no, brain, it's okay. I want to be here. Your brain goes, oh, okay, let me chill. And, and you, if you do that with anything, you know what I mean? Wow. Like if, you know, if uh, all of a sudden you, you, you get lucky with a supermodel and you show up, she shows up to your house and you're there, you're like, okay, this is going to happen. You got to tell, I want her to be here. And that's what you have to say. She has to say the same thing too, otherwise it's a crime. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, but okay, does, does this apply to like going to the doctor or the dentist? Do I need to tell, like when I'm at the dentist, I want to be here? And yeah, except that still hurts for real. <laughs> like I, I, dude, I, scared, I get scared of doctors and dentists so much, yeah. especially dentists. I'm like, Ugh. Yeah, there's something about that, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, that's, that, 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 that's amazing. Um, let's get back into the boxing for a second before we get into the comedy and, and, and your film. So uh, you grew up in New York. Yes. Puerto Rican. Yes, Bronx boy. Right now, I think the reason why you did so well in Asia is you're a little chinito. Yes, so they, I, yeah. everybody thinks I'm Filipino. Yeah, yeah. So you did well there. They're like, oh, he's, 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 yes, he's yes. Latino, but he's, he's probably yes. Asian as well. Um, so Any, you go Anytime I'm at the hospital, people think, you work here? You work here? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I feel like I'm wearing a red shirt at Target. You know what I mean? It's like, everybody thinks I work here. <laughs> Yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of male Filipino nurses yes. in Los Angeles. Yes. Thank God, bless them. Um, my my ex was a Filipino, and she's amazing. Oh, okay. I love her Filipino family. I speak Tagalog actually. Oh, do you see that? Um, Como se llama? But so, how did you get into boxing? And well, before the where'd you grow up in New York? What part? Uh, in the Bronx. Bronx. The Bronx. Yeah. The Bronx, yeah. yeah. And uh, how did you get into boxing? Uh, you know what? Um, I think I like boxing ever since. I'm I'm gonna say when I saw Rocky as a little boy, uh, 1976. But boxing was just always my dream. My, my aunt gave me a pair of boxing gloves one time, and it was funny because she didn't get me two pairs. She got me one pair. So me and my friends would box with just one arm like this. You know? Oh, that's <laughs> and, hilarious. Yeah. And uh, so I learned to fight with one arm really well. But um, it's just I got into it. And then um, I always liked boxing. And then when I was, I think, 12 or 13, I, I, moved, to a, I moved to my grandmother, and she lived in a different area of the Bronx. And there was a boxing club not too far. And... Um, I remember I went there on a Sunday and the place was closed, but they had a, a mail slot, right? And I, and I pushed the mail slot open and I saw for the first time in my life, I saw bags and I saw a ring and I, I saw a speed bag and, and I, I smelled that gym smell yeah. of leather and sweat. And I'm like, I, I was in awe. I was like, I want to be here. So the next day, Monday after school, I went there and uh, it was five bucks a month, right? It was five months bucks a month to, to, to join the gym, and I had no money. I was broke as hell, you know. And the guy goes, all right, you could just clean up and uh, clean the place up, and you, you could work out for free. And I'm like, oh, okay. And that was it, man. That's all she wrote. So how, why didn't you follow through? Was it, was it, uh, did well, you get I, I mean, I, I followed through in the sense of, uh, yeah, I did follow through. Uh, I mean, I, I fought amateur for, for, for a while. I, I won, I was in the Golden Gloves twice. I won the Junior Olympics. I won the Kid Gloves. Then I turned pro. Okay. And then when I turned pro, I moved to Arizona to turn pro. And I, I was the Arizona lightweight champion. I fought for the NABF title. Really? Yeah, yeah. What was your, what was your professional record? Uh, it was like 17, 7, and 1. 
Okay. It wasn't a beautiful, but it wasn't ugly either. <laughs> so what, so I, what, did you start doing comedy while you were boxing? How, what what was did, the transition between I did that? it at the very end of my boxing career, yeah. I've always liked comedy. Like Comedy was, like, you know those people, there are people out there who love sports but never played? Right. That was me about comedy. I listened to comedy, I watched comedy, I studied comedy, but I never thought I could ever, because I, I was stage, I had stage fright. I never thought yeah. I could get up there and, and tell make strangers laugh with lights on me and stuff. I'm like, I, not, I can't do that. But then one day I went to uh, this, you know, it's funny. The, when I was living in Arizona, Tucson, they opened up a brand new comedy club, a real comedy club with the, with the brick background, the microphone, the lights. And when I went in there for the first time, I felt exactly the same as when I opened up that little mail slot and I saw a boxing gym for the first time. I was like, oh, this is it. This is the real thing, you know? And, um, and then I went just to watch. And I remember I sat in the back because I was too afraid the comedian was going to make fun of me. And then, um, and then you know, my, I was with friends, and, and they, they were promoting an open mic on a Tuesday or something. They go, you should do it, you should do it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. But to me, it was just, I didn't want to be a comedian. I was like jumping out of a plane, I'm uh, bungee jumping. I'm just going to do something crazy, right? So I did it, and then I realized that if I did it a couple more times, I could be friends with what I thought were real comedians, but they were just open micers. And uh, if you're an open micer, I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I, I just wanted to, so I did it a couple more times, did it like two or three more times, because I just wanted to be friends with open micers, right, all, all these comedians. And, like, but back then, the, those comedians, Pablo Francisco was one of them. Uh, a guy named Butch Lord was another one. There was uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Jason Robacher. These are all people who became really good friends of mine. Um, but they were back then, you know, and Pablo Francisco is huge. He's, he's one of the funniest dudes on the planet. But um, but then that's it. I stopped. I, I, I didn't want to do comedy anymore. I just like, okay, I, I got my thrill. Or, you know. And then one day I went to, I, I hit, my life hit rock bottom. I went back to the comedy club because I was broke. I was poor. I had no, they could let me in free at least because they knew me. And then I remember looking at the comedian on stage and I remember thinking to myself, I go, you know what? Because I was feeling sorry for myself right before that. And I said, I can start my life all over again. I literally, so I go, I have nothing holding me back. I'm basically homeless. I could do whatever I want. I go, I'm going to become a comedian full time, a real one. And that was it. You know, and that was uh, two years ago. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and that was, uh, yeah, that was a million years ago. That was 30 years ago, man. So, so your comedy started in Arizona. Yeah. Did you go back to New York and do comedy there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've done, I went back to, I've done comedy in New York plenty of times. Um, I did the Apollo. I did uh, at Caroline's. What, at what point did you become the like you know a professional comedian to where you're like okay this is working out this is going in the direction that I needed to go? I think early on only because I I didn't give myself a way out you know what I mean like I didn't go oh I'll I'll have this part time job I'll no do, plan I B no plan B dude I was donating plasma I was living in my car and I'm like I'm gonna either make it or I'm gonna be dead <laughs> you know what I mean and or you know homeless forever. But I just kept on doing it, kept on doing it, kept on doing it. And you know how it is. We're, we're kind of all really are in the same business. We're all doing different things, right? And um, I just knew, okay, I'm going to do something. You know, I've got to, um, I just, I just got to make it work for me. So what, I think the point where I knew I was not turning back was I decided I was going to move either to Houston, Texas, because it's center and I could travel, or I was going to move to L.A. and try to make it even better and bigger, right? So I decided, I just I had no money in my pocket. I had like 600 bucks in my pocket. I was on my way here. I remember my car broke down like on the way here and it was right around 600 bucks. So I fixed it with, and I had no money, I had nothing. And then uh, I just, I did a talk about bungee jumping. I'm gonna back up. I did it. This was when you would send, uh, not links, you would send VHS tapes to different bookers. And I wanted to be different. So I, I, I bungee jumped uh, once and I, I said, listen, if I can take a, so I, I'm looking at the camera and I'm talking to bookers. I'm like, hey man, this is Joy Medina. I'm a comedian, whatever. And I go, if I can take a chance on this bungee jump, you can take a chance on booking me. And so I, I, I put that on all my tapes, in the beginning of my tapes of all my stand-up. And then some company out of LA called me up. They go, hey man, um, and I was broke, dude. I was zero money. I, I just moved here. And they go, hey man, we saw your tape. It was, I go, I already, I go. I already called you before I even saw your stand up. I don't even know if you're funny or not, but I love the way you opened it. And then they go, "Hey man, uh, we we're doing some military gigs. You know, they pays. I think at the time it's like two thousand dollars, which is like might as well have been two million, right? And I'm like, yes, well, yes, I'll do it. Yes, yes. And with that money, I, I bought. I ended up, um, you know, paying some bills and stuff. But I ended up buying a laptop and I started writing a script. And I'm like, I'm, you know, just doing LA stuff. 
<laughs> ah, now you're now, now you're a typical LA guy, Joe. Yes, well. <laughs> okay, I gotta ask this, man. You know, um, what, what are the comedy clubs that you kind of hang out with? Or hang out at more the Laugh Factory. The Laugh Factory, you're there a lot. Are you there at the comedy store? Uh, the comedy, the, uh, all the all the clubs. Um, ha ha, I love the ha ha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, the ha comedy cool. club is That's a great a club. Scene. It's um, it's just good vibe. And so Laugh Factory, Ice House, hopefully Ice House, it's yeah. be opening up soon. That's a great scene. So um, you're you're always hanging out backstage with the comics, right? And you know, especially with some of these younger comics, they might get a little smart ass with you, considering oh, yeah. that you were a professional <laughs> boxer. Sometimes they might not know. Has there ever been a moment? in the past 30 years where you had to kind of like, you know, oh, you know yeah. put a comic in, in, in their place backstage, please. <laughs> yes, yes. More than once. But, um, and, I, and, and I'm and i a nice guy, man. I really am a nice guy. But there was, and, and I'm not going to mention names because I'm not like that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you off camera. <laughs> yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try yeah. to guess. All right, what happened? But no, no, there was this one comic who, um, I was working in a, not even in LA, in LA, it was in another city where he's from. And, um, it was uh, it was for a police thing where they hired me because it, it, was, it was to raise money, whatever, and some other people. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm down. So they flew me there, you know. And and this guy's going up there. And I told the promoter, I go, hey, man, this dude goes past his time. Please don't let him go past his time. Don't let him go time. Let's just let's get to wrap this up, right? Because to me, it's about business. Let's right. get this done. So, of course, he's up there, and he's going over and over. And he's saying the N-word, and he's not even black, and he's doing this and that. And he's like... He's just like, oh, hurry the heck up. So I go up to the DJ. I go, dude, cut the mic off. Cut the mic off. So he cut the mic off. And he's still going up. Damn, man, you cut my mic off. And he's, in there. <laughs> and he's doing all this thing. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm pissed. And there was another comic there, too, that was going on in between us. He's like, oh, oh. Like, he's already know because I'm pissed. So anyway, this guy gets off stage. I pull him to the side. And I, and I get right in his face, and I start, I'm like, oh, you F this, you this, that, this, blah, 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 you're so unprofessional, da, da, da. He goes, oh, people came to see me. I'm like, dude, you live here. Nobody came to see you, bro. They can see you every day of the week. I go, they, they came for this benefit, blah, 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 blah. So he goes, uh, I go, you better, you better apologize. He's like, he goes, you better get, a, you, you get, you got to step off my face. And I was like, that's, that's when I got closer, man. And um, I didn't grab him by the neck, but I told him, I said, I'm going to choke you right now, bro. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to like kill you. Like I was so angry. Like, I'm like, I'm, I already knew, okay, I'm not even going to go on stage because I'm probably going to go to jail. Right. And, um, so I walked away and then I came back and I said, listen, I'm sorry I came up to you that way, but you're a hole and nobody likes you and da, da, da. And I just let it out, but he apologized and everything went fine. But that was just, that's just one of them. But you know, it's just, it's not about me being an ex-boxer about this or that. It's just dis disrespect. I hate I hate when people disrespect. And sometimes people disrespect by mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm sure I've done it. I've shown, I've, I might have said something or done something. Like, you know, I was wrong. But I'm the kind of person that I try to be anyway, where if I screw up, I go, hey, man, you know what? What I did the other day was wrong. What I said earlier was wrong. Like, a matter of fact, I got into something with a guy in Starbucks a couple of years ago. I was in a bad mood. I think I was going through menopause or whatever, man. <laughs> I was just in a bad mood. I was in Starbucks. And this dude... He would just like everywhere I would I was trying to go throw something away and he would just keep blocking me. Like in, in to me it felt like he was doing it on purpose, but he wasn't. But I'm just like and then finally, like I, I finally got it, and then he was walking out and I was walking out. We were just looking at each other like two dogs. And I got in his face, man, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna kill this dude. And then he's like, he could see that I, I wasn't gonna hit him yet. And so he was getting to me, and I'm like, oh, this is gonna get bad. This is gonna get bad. And I said a whole bunch of stuff. I said stuff I shouldn't have said. <laughs> you know? You're a comic and a boxer. Yes, I think yes. you're good in confrontation. <laughs> yeah. But then I felt bad the next day, dude, for like for a week. I kept on going back around the same time because I wanted to apologize to him because I was, I was wrong. I was the one that was wrong. Right. And I was like, oh, man, I, I screwed up. I screwed up. I should, you know, I should. I was just too harsh. And, like, and I, I'm, I'm venomous with my. Are you, you a know, Scorpio? No, I'm an Aries. Oh, I'm an Aries too. Oh, Hell yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm like, I know how to use, like you said, being a yeah. comedian, man, I know how to use words and I know how to get to you. Right. You know, and, and sometimes some people say things that you probably shouldn't ever say because they're either, they sound too this or too that or too this. But the thing is, when you're angry and you want to hurt somebody, you do say those words. Mm -hmm. And not that you believe those words, it's that you know those words are hurtful. Right. So, um, so it's not necessarily, you know, someone is... Is, is racist or homophobic or whatever whatever the words are, gonna, are. It's just that they pick the big ones to, and I and I use some of those words on that dude. Yeah. And I was like, nah, not good, man. I, yeah. I, I, I felt I, I was disappointed in myself. Okay, this is a good segue into your short film. Oh, okay. Beautiful violence. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, you're not in it. 
No. Okay, so I... A I, good I, director hardly ever puts himself in. I, that's yeah, hard. And I, I give a little room. A little room. <laughs> a little, no, yeah. I thought it was directed awesome. I thought, I, thought, I thought the script and the acting was amazing. Thank you, thank you. Um, and, and, you know, you're talking about words, using the wrong words. Not to give too much away, but it's, it's, it follows someone who uh, starts using the wrong word. Right. Uh, you know, you want to tell us a little bit about that, but he's doing it for a reason. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's this... Uh, basically, the story ends up um, where you see a, a frustrated white man... Um, looking for something, he ends up in an alley with an uh, African American drug dealer, and he calls him the N word, and that's that's in you know you, when you right now if you're going what, that's what everybody watches it says, and until you watch it and then you realize what happens. And I'll tell you what what, what you know I'll tell you the story. It doesn't matter. Um, he basically th this guy is is basically uh, you know he finds out he's got very little to live, months to live. And his life insurance pays double if he's killed in a homicide. So he decides, okay, I'm going to get somebody to kill me so my wife and family gets double the, the insurance money, whatever it is, right? A million, two million, whatever it is. But then the guy, person doesn't show up. So now he's frustrated and he's nervous and he's, you know, he's just thinking he's, he's, he's in a panic. And he, when he sees this drug dealer in the alley, he just says, okay, he thinks to himself, if I go over there and I call him the N-word, he'll kill me, shoot me, and it'll be, it'll be done. But the guy doesn't have a gun. He just ends up beating the hell out of him. But they get to know each other, you know, and they find out the white guy isn't racist. His family is black. The black guy really isn't a bad person. He's there trying to take care of his family, who's, you know, he's got a son with cerebral palsy. He's got a daughter. He's got a wife. And he's, he, you know, he's the only money maker in the family. And, and I made sure, like, in the script, as you, you know, when you watch it, I made him. I made him a responsible parent. I made him uh, a college graduate. I tried, even though he's. I put him in a, you know, in a in a negative vibe, in a negative stereotype. I also put him in a positive stereotype, mm -hmm. because I think in life, people can be good and bad at the same time. And if you know, when you watch my film, when you watch Beautiful Violence, there's really no straight good guy or bad guy. You know, it's just they're both doing what they got to do to yeah. take care of the family. And sometimes it, it's not good or bad. It's just you do what you got to do. You know what I mean? I used to catch back in the day before comedy, before, uh, what's about, no, no, right around boxing time. I used to, there was, I used to catch shoplifters. I used to work at Mervyn's back in the day, Montgomery Ward. So, man, it's just like the, the, the ghost of Christmas. You were loss past. prevention? Loss prevention. Yeah, I used to do all of that. <laughs> And there were times where, you know, you catch people stealing to steal, but then you catch people stealing because they're hungry. Right. Or they got kids. You know, someone stole diapers. I'm like, I, I just let them go. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's not, they're not stealing for me. You know, it's not more than my personal stuff. But even if it was, I would understand. To me, they weren't stealing. They were surviving. Yeah. You know? And uh, so I would always let them go. And I, I always had compassion for people like that, you know? But, um, and I like, my, I like when I write stories. I like when I write scripts. I like to make them compassion. I like to make... People have. I like to. The audience have empathy for for people, you know. Well, he, he, wh wh why? Because you know, when I watched the film, I was expecting to see a comedy. I got to be honest with you, Joe. <laughs> a lot of people. I never tell them it's a drama. <laughs> yeah. So, so what would compel you to make? Like, why did you write this film, and 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 why would, did you write something so serious, given that your entire brand is is mostly built on you being right. a comedian? That's a good question. Um, the the thing is, I've I've wanted to be a filmmaker before I even did comedy. I did uh, my first film, I was in fifth, no, seventh grade, and I bought a stolen camera, uh, a projector, and a screen from a, from a teacher in my school, my junior high school, and I made a little Godzilla, uh, King Kong movie, right? And I always love, I, I mean, I love comedy. I've, I've always been a comedian. Somebody falls and trips, I'm going to laugh. I don't care. I'm sorry. I'll help you up afterwards, but I will laugh because I just think it's funny. But um, the reason I got into drama was for a couple reasons. But the main reason was because um, I want people to take me serious as a filmmaker. Because when all people know you as a comic, that's all they're going to think you do, right? And if you do something comedic, they go, ah, it's part of his comedy world. It's not of him being a filmmaker, it's him being a, a comedian director, right? So the first thing I wanted to do was a uh, horror movie. I did a horror movie. My first for short film, my first film was a comedy, mm -hmm. but my sh first short film, when I started thinking this way, was a, a, a horror movie. But it wasn't like, uh, it was more psychological, more torture. It was very dark, really dark. 
And it was a, it, I won awards with that film too. It was it was black and white except the blood. The blood was in color. Ooh, what was it called? Yeah, it was called Missing. That's on YouTube right now. It's yeah. on Vimeo. Yeah, it's Missing. called Missing. Put my name, Joy Medina, and you'll see it. And uh, I won some awards with that. Um, and that was fun doing it. And I did that because I wanted to show people the opposite of comedy. Mm. And then the reason I like dramas is because it makes you feel something. Like mm. I make, if I made a comedy, it'll make you laugh, right? But it'll make you laugh months from now when you see it. As a comic, I like making people laugh right now. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna make you laugh right now when I say this joke and you'll laugh and I move on, right? But I won't get that from comedy. But um, so if I'm gonna make you laugh, I wanna make you laugh that way. Mm. If I'm gonna make you feel something else, it, later on, then let me pick what I'm gonna do. So I wanna, I want, that's when I love drama. I love dramas. I've written so many, I've written probably more dramas than comedies. Really? Yeah, and I've directed probably more, more dramas than comedies. And um, it's only because I get to feel people. Like I, I remember my last two short films, this one, Beautiful Violence and The Lesson, two, two people on set cried while we were shooting. And I'm like, I looked at my DP and I'm like, yeah, that's it, we got it. Cause I, cause that's the thing. And that, there's a thing that I, I do myself too when I'm writing. If I don't cry when I'm writing a scene that people should cry on, then it's not a good scene, and I keep writing it. It might be a comedy. Yeah, it might be a comedy. <laughs> well, look, I, I, you know, I, I read this when I was young, and I tell this, uh, you know, to a lot of comedians when when it, when it comes up in my head. Um, I, a quote about what comedy is from like hundreds of years ago. I don't know who wrote it. Was some philosopher, and he said. That comedy, I think he said laughter. He said laughter is the death of a serious emotion. Meaning something serious is happening, but right. you're taking the emotion out of it. Right. right? So a lot of times in comedy we laugh, like you say, if somebody slips on a banana peel. Right. So much of comedy, not everything of comedy, but so much of comedy is actually something that is kind of scary, uh, negative, dark, whatever. But right. instead of reacting to it emotionally, you're ripping the emotion out of it. And not all that's left is the game of, of, of the logic of the situation. Yeah. And, and, and that laughter is the radiation of the seriousness. No. So you can, you can either approach something seriously or not. It, it's, it's, and so um, it, it's interesting, you know, as, as, as someone who appreciates comedy and has, you know, tried it and, 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 and I'm a writer and I write a lot of funny things too. As I've gotten older, I've really realized that I can lean into the drama mm -hmm. because, because all I have to do is, is I can see a dark, difficult situation, but I leave the emotion in. Right. The difference in comedy is you take the emotion out and then it's like, oh, you're laughing at, at the fact that you're broke and your fucking girlfriend left you and everyone hates right, right, your guts. Right, right. Or leave the emotion in and then it's a drama. <laughs> oh, you're broke and you're going, oh, God. So, yeah, sometimes yeah. it's both. You yeah. know, like, it, like this film, there's, there's, there's jokes in the film right, and right. It's, it's really dark film right. but there's still jokes in there because in real life that's the way it would work yeah that's the way it works you know and it's if two people if one guy just beat the hell out of you if you're laying bloody there and, you, and you're like what the hell's going on you have to while you can be like hey dude okay what's your name you know? <laughs> <laughs> like let's get to know each other gallows right? humor yeah and, it, and it's and it's you know and i think it's and another humor is another way for us to deal with deal with um, right bad stuff. You know, when we did the Latin Kings of Comedy, it was Paul Rodriguez, George Lopez, it was me, it was um, uh, uh, Cheech, what Alex Ramundo. Yeah. So we what did, a lineup. Yeah, it was fun. We did, a, one of the things we did during that week we were all in El Paso was we went to a children's hospital for terminally kids, terminally ill children. Uh, boy, that was hard. Um, I'm a really, especially now the older I've gotten, I'm very empathetic and sympathetic and compassionate and everything. But, but back then I was the same way. But we would see these kids, these little kids who, you know, who were bald because of chemo, walking around with IVs and they're being so chipper. And all of us took a time, like, I gotta go to the bathroom. And we would just go to the bathroom, ball, right? And then somebody else, I gotta go to the bathroom. And then, but the second we walked out of the hospital, all we did was make fun of those kids. And, and I remember thinking, I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, I, we, did we mean it? Absolutely not. It was just, because we couldn't even do it with a regular person. Right. We had to do it with comedians right. because a regular person would be like, well, why, why are you saying that? That's horrible. Yeah. No, we had to. Yeah. And it, it was because it was just like, I need, it was, it was horrible. It was like to see a child sick like that, right? right. It, and, and to try to make them laugh, it's so hard to do. Yeah. Um, the, I remember my, my grandma, she, she wasn't my real grandmother, but she was, she, I was, she's my girlfriend's grandma, it's a long story, but she passed away a few years ago. And I had to do a show that night. And it was the hardest show out of my 30 years of comedy 
that I ever had to do because that wasn't me. I felt like I was like a, a shell, like I was a robot and I was just on there and I was just talking. And I remember like I had no emotion. I didn't sell my jokes. I was just t doing my jokes like a robot. Like I was just doing all this. And I remember telling him, listen, if you guys think I'm a little awkward right now, I am. And I'll explain later. I don't want to tell you now because I don't want to ruin my, it's hard to follow. Yeah. Hey, my grandmother died. All right. So anyway, I was walking down the street the other day, right? So, so, yeah. he, so I'm like, so the funny thing was I did a, I did a, we could also find this on YouTube. I did a, a video for my grandmother called Grambo, like Rambo. Grambo. But it was, it was a, it's a trailer of, of a, a woman named Grambo who's like Grambo and she's killing all these terrorists and stuff. And I made, I made this trailer. So I played it for them afterwards that same night. And the funny thing is the weird how life works is uh, there was one guy, he's a comic a friend of mine who was in the, in the video too. And he plays every, every Asian guy. She kills like five different guys. He's, a, he's, he's the same Asian guy the whole time. That is a freak. <laughs> I just, and not that I tried, it was just I, didn't, I had nobody else. But, um, That's so funny. But I just changed hats or whatever <laughs> on him, but nobody knows the difference. But, um, <laughs> And then, but uh, uh, and he, he's a great guy. But he was my opening act on that day, and I'm like, what are the odds, right? What are the odds? And I'm showing Grambo, and he's the opening act, and it's the same day she passed. And so, so I showed it to them, and I cried, and they cried, and he cried, and it was a whole thing. But it was hard. It's hard to do that show, but it was hard to do that show. I can imagine. Yeah. But it, it, it's funny, you know, just like talk about like gallows humor, like death, death. When, when death comes into your life, you know, my, I have a grandmother that died uh, last year and I went back to Miami for the funeral and, um, you know, there, there was a, some of my uncles and, and, and aunts and me and, and my mom had, had, you know, dinner afterwards and, you know, we started cracking after we got all the crying out, you know, there was right. a lot of cracking jokes and, yes. and, and I think my grandmother would have laughed. We talked about funny things that she would do and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's very interesting. Uh, get, getting to a couple more things before, before we wrap up. Um, I think it's cool, you know, and watching, you know, not only did you step outside of something you're associated with by doing such a, such a, such a hard-hitting drama, you know, when people associate mm -hmm. you with comedy, you know, for the most part, but people also associate you with the Latino uh, community and entertainment, and, and you worked with a white guy and a black guy. How important is it for you to step outside the worlds that you kind of, like, come from? Latin comedians and work with people that are not Latin or work with people that are not even comics. How important for you is it to step outside of your brand, so to speak? Well, I mean, it's important because, you know, unfortunately in this, in this business that we're in, right, people get branded and people sometimes get branded in, in ways you don't want to. It's like, you're that guy mm -hmm. or you can only do this. And that's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to do drama, right, and horror, because I didn't want people to think, oh, this guy can only do comedy. I love comedy. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a comedy now that's, that's, it is my blazing saddles. And I'm so proud of this comedy. It is stupid. That's how funny it is. It's just stupid. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's stupid. stupid. It's stupid. It's not bright at all, yeah. but it's so funny. So anyway, um, but, you know, I think it's important. Like, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm other than compared, you know, compared to other comedians, there aren't too many comedians that are writer, producers, and directors. And award-winning ones, man. You know, like this film alone won 67 awards. Wow. Man. 67. You're two away from 69. That's right. That's going to be the best one. I'm going to stop. I don't want any more awards after that. <laughs> but uh, you see, we think the same. Yeah. And, uh, no, no, but it's, um, you know, so it's like, and all my stuff, except one project didn't win an award. But um, and I think it deserved it. But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll just keep submitting it. But, um, yeah, so it's, it's important because I just want people to know that I can do other things, right? Like... Like, you know, Louis C.K., um, for, he's a writer, producer, director. Mm -hmm. you know? Editor, too. An editor, yeah. And he does his show. So I did a, when I saw, when I realized that at one point, I said, oh, man, I wish I could do that. And then I'm like, wait a second, I can. And I ended up writing uh, my own sitcom pilot called Man of a Funny Age. And that's a pr pr project that I said sh I should have won some awards. But um, it's a great pilot. Like, and when I wrote it and when I when I produced it, like my, my DP is a really he's he's got two Emmys. He's he's a great smart dude, and him and I get along perfect. And I told him I said when I I don't want a sizzle reel. I'm gonna shoot this so it can be broadcast ready. Not that someone's gonna pick it up and broadcast it. I just want somebody, a network, to realize I can do it. I can be the cheap man's Louis C.K., right? The poor man's Louis C.K. where I could write, produce, direct. Because a lot, every comedian in the world has an idea. Mm -hmm. You know, half, the, half those guys have got a script, mm -hmm. you know? And then half those guys have got a sizzle reel. I want to be the one guy 
who did it all and can do it good. Because like, I've seen other people's projects and I'm like, eh, it's a little rough around the edges, it could be better, you know? And uh, um, trust me, my, my first project was horrible, right? Even though it won awards too, but I, I don't, I, I, so I'll call El Matador, but I don't recommend it to anybody to watch, unless you're high, you could watch it. But, because um, then it's funny. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, you just, uh, you know, you just, you just got to be better than you always were. And, and as a comedian or as a host or as a producer, writer, whatever, you're always trying to up yourself. You're always trying to do, like, I want to do better now. I want this one to be better. I want this one to be bigger. Like, you know, people say, why don't you do a feature? I, I've written features. I have features. But I can't finance a feature by myself. Mm -hmm. I can finance, finance uh, a short film by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a couple thousand dollars. I can do that, right? But I can't make, you know, a fifty, a hundred thousand dollar movie by myself. I wish I could, but yeah. I can't. So... So those are the things I want to do. And, but, you know, um, but again, you know, it's just, it's being an artist, man. You just want, you want to create and you want to do the things you want to do. And you want to, I had a podcast for a while, you know, and then that was just too hard getting guests all the time. Okay. And I'm like, ugh. There's a legendary story that, that, that okay, you're involved oh, with. God. Yeah. Right. I don't know if you're, I mean, you can tell me. Okay, we'll okay. cut it out. What's the story of... Um, God, that you helped write something, but you don't get any money from it. Something for either uh, Jennifer Lopez or Eva Longoria. Or... Oh, I wrote you... a lot of stuff that I don't get money for. Did you <laughs> Did you work with any of these uh, of these women? Jennifer um, Lopez. Mm, no, I have. I've no, I've written for the Alma Awards. Right. And I did a sketch for the Alma Awards, which I didn't get paid for. For uh, that involved but, Eva Longoria. Um, I don't know if. Um, because they're all part of it, but I don't know if they were directly part of that. They weren't directly part of that with me. So I don't know. I did that. Paul Rodriguez had me help him do a sketch and write it. and So I ended up doing it. So, But but with them... Um, what was this? Didn't Jennifer Lopez, wasn't she going to do... I think this is from the Rick Nahara stuff, that she was going to do something about security guards. She was going to like executive produce some comedy about security guards. You know what? That actually does... Sounds familiar. I think you've given out a bunch of ideas that people have just taken. <laughs> that I know is true. That I know is true. <laughs> is that the story of a comic in LA or what, dude? Yeah, and it's that's why you know I tell people, like this is this is it's it's so easy for a comic or an actor or writer or, or any one of us artists to, hey man, I got this great idea for this. I got this great, and then after a while you start running out of people to say because. What? Just write oh, no. it. That somebody that somebody pretends to sue you, Joey. Am I? I hope I'm not confusing you for another a Latin comic. Could be. Somebody Sorry. pretends to sue you, but they don't for some sort of IP or something that you were involved with and they took. No, no, I don't think that was me. If they did, I don't remember. <laughs> you know, I used to be a professional boxer. I don't remember a lot. I don't remember anniversaries. It's I don't like remember some, birthdays. It's like some telltale <laughs> lesson about about like, oh yeah, you do stuff in Hollywood and you help somebody out and then they take the idea and run with it and they be, they're you fucking some big name or no, whatever. No, but that does happen. That does yeah. happen a lot, you know. And and what are you gonna do? That's the reason why I don't mention certain things like right. the, my. I'll tell you the I'll, I'll tell you the name when uh, off camera, yeah. but only because the name is so catchy yeah. for my for my Blazing Saddles movie. Mm -hmm. And um, I've said it a couple times here and there, but it's not too much. But it's it's just going to be hilarious. It's going to be the funniest thing since sliced bread. I can't wait. Um, so look, wrapping this up. So uh, you're going to get back into directing some comedies after these hard hitting dramas that are that yes, are yes. Uh, winning all these awards. Beautiful violence. Is that something that people can see now, or are you finishing this, the festival circuit? I'm, and still, I'm still doing the festival circuit. We just got into the Malibu International Film Festival, so nice. that's going to be good. Uh, so, um, but. What I'll do is for all the listeners, if you follow me on Instagram, which is Joey Medina Comic, one word, Joey Medina Comic, I'll send you a private link to watch the to watch the film. Amazing. Because I can't put it public yet, but I'll awesome. send you a private link. Beautiful, Joey. It's been a pleasure, man. My uh, pleasure, like brother. Like I said, you you I don't just use that uh, the term legend, um, you know, loosely, but you you, you really are someone in the and, and, and not just in the Latin community, but comedians all over the place. They respect you. you, and I'm loving the filmmaking. This whole dramatic side of you that I didn't even know existed. Thank so. You. Um, dude, when you do your Blazing Saddles, uh, you're going to come back here and we're going to talk about it. Absolutely. Oh, trust me, a lot of people want to talk about this awesome. one. Hey. It's so bad, but so good. Joy Medina, you've been on Shakira. <laughs> thank you, thank you.